Good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about myth busting in a, uh, attachment. Now, I, I, this was not my title, I have to tell you. So I think ACAM specifically said, would you talk about myth busting around attachment theory? And I thought to myself, well, um, this is a subject that I've been studying for the last 20 years, and you're asking me to have a pop at it. Um, but so I'm going to do my best, but I've given it a subtitle, uh, which is a rather more boring and academic and considered rephrasing of the title, which is, or rather some sorry. Empir sorry, <laughs> empirical challenges to commonly held interpretations of attachment theory. Let's, although I'm going to sneak at the end of this talk some proper myth-busting, but it will just be the last minute or so of my talk. What I, what I would like to do is, is um, tell you about some of the work that, that colleagues and I uh, have been doing over the last few years, which is to actually try to in a sense, establish where are we at with this really important subject. Um, what, what does the data tell us about what's more or less accurate or correct about attachment theory? What needs revising? What's the status of this theory with, with respect to a lot of accumulated evidence over the last 30 or 40 years? Um, before I started, before I start to have a pop at my favourite theory, um, I want to say something about how in incredibly significant uh, attachment theory is. I think it's quite easy, certainly for me, to be you know, very kind of engaged in, at the coalface of, of doing research on attachment theory and, and, and not to step back and think about the influence that this theory has had or what, you know, what this theory really represents. And it's, I still believe, despite some of the uh, uh, empirical qualifications to uh, the theory that I'll... I'll uh, talk to you about in a moment, that it's one of the most extraordinary pieces of theoretical uh, enterprise that, that we've seen in the field of psychology in the last 50 or so years. Um, John Bowlby made the most incredible contribution uh, to, our, to our social, uh, our clinical and our intellectual lives when he developed attachment theory, deeply, profoundly rooted in evolutionary thinking uh, uh, and in you know, interesting ideas around cybernetics uh, and on biology, but also integrating psychoanalysis and cognitive theory and so on. It's the most amazing, eclectic, but rigorous and coherent developmental theory, I think, that has actually probably ever been invented. And not only that, but it stands the test of time rather well. And some of the fundamentals that we think are encapsulated by that theory, particularly the basic idea that children have a biologically predisposed uh, set of instincts to seek out the care of, 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 uh, of, of reliable others as a way of affording them uh, protection in the face of potential threats to their development. That, I cannot believe, is not basically true. So I'm not going to have a pop at that basic idea. It must be surely one of the things, one of the few things uh, we can genuinely uh, agree on. Um, and, and in fact, where the qualifications have to come in are around some of the margins of this theory, um, uh, and particularly the way that the theory developed in, in contemporary uh, research. The other thing I wanted to add, actually, it picked up a, a, a point that was just absolutely beautifully made by David Olds at the beginning of today, which is just the sheer reach of the impact of this theory. Because there's the theory itself and the, uh, uh, the contemporary framework developed by Mary Ainsworth and others over the last, and very influentially also by Marina van Eisendon. But if you think about the, the sort of the flavour of what John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth was trying to do back in the, uh, in the late 50s and 60s, uh, um, you see the influence of that theory in almost every uh, field of developmental and clinical psychology to this day. Um, so, uh, um, as, as David was pointing out, uh, the, the, the much of what we think of as contemporary developmental psychopathology really had its roots in some of the basic ideas that, that Bowlby uh, uh, developed, and it's, it's had an enormously widespread impact. And, that, that's, and almost all of that, I would say, has been extremely positive. That's my little... Um, uh, uh, now I move on to some of the more, uh, let's say, critical um, uh, issues. I'm sorry, I'm going to be slightly put off by the screen because it keeps flashing at me in a bright pink. Uh, looks a little bit... Anyway, so maybe I'll try not to look at it because it's, it's actually really putting me off. OK, um, so, uh, um, so the rest of my talk I'm going to touch on what I would say uh, are probably three of the most important uh, propositions of attachment theory uh, uh, as we currently understand it. Uh, and they are the following. So one of them, of course, uh, is that... There's a proposition within attachment theory, they're quite strong claims that attachment theory is making, that, the, uh, that attachment insecurity is fundamentally something about the environment and the caregiving environment around the child. So, of course, touching on what Gordon was just talking about, the counter uh, uh, factual to that, if you like, is that you know, it could also be genetic. But attachment theory makes the very strong and very clear 
prediction that actually when we look at variation in attachment security and insecurity, what we're doing is seeing variation that is all entirely due to uh, variability in the quality of care provided to the child. It's fundamentally an environmental uh, set of influences and not about the child's genes. Very clear prediction. We're going to find out whether that prediction is in fact correct. Uh, the second really important uh, um, proposition uh, that Bowlby and others subsequently uh, uh, put forward about attachment is that patterns of attachment develop very early in life. Uh, they are laid down early and they, and they remain persistent influences on a child's development throughout the lifespan and indeed may be transmitted from one generation to the next. That's a fundamental uh, uh, um, uh, tenet, if you like, of attachment theory. And again, I'm going to present to you some evidence about whether or not the data really holds up uh, uh, on this crucial question about attachment and its stability over time and its stability to be, as it were, transmitted from one generation to the next. Um, and then finally, well, I'm sure there are more, but these are, my, these are the ones that we've worked on particularly, but they are very central, I think. The final one is that attachment security is important for children's mental health. So it's not a given that that might be the, that is the case, but it's certainly a proposition that people make, that a secure attachment bond, I feel like I'm about to be, or as if I am, quoting from pretty much every developmental uh, psychology textbook you can think of, Attach attachment security is fundamentally important for children's future socio-emotional development, their adaptation and their well-being. Right? That's, that, that's the entree to most papers on attachment, although I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit careful about how I say that these days because of the work that I've done on this uh, subject recently. But these are fundamental questions um, uh, and predictions of the theory. And um, I suppose one, one reflection before we dive into this, that, that I mean, one of the lovely things about doing research is that now and then you do accumulate enough fairly clear evidence where you, think, you can step back and think, do you know what? I think we almost know the answer to these, these questions. And that's a really, it, it, you'd be, for those of you who aren't researchers, it's, it's depressingly uh, you know, not the case most of the time. Most of the time we just don't really know anything and we're trying our best and everything's a bit equivocal. But um, I feel like we're in a position where I can say with a little bit of confidence more or less where we're at with those uh, subjects. Uh, uh, and, and I hope that will be helpful, both for asserting the continuing vigour and usefulness of attachment theory as a framework, but also for asserting some caution and care uh, and pointing out where we clearly need to either draw back some of the strong claims we might make about attachment or that we just need to do much more careful research in order to uh, uh, better understand some of the, some of the, 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 the puzzles posed to us by the evidence. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. So the first one is uh, genetics and the environment. Um, Gordon already mentioned that uh, twin studies are probably the, the, the most uh, uh, powerful uh, and, and commonly used method for addressing these questions about heritability. The attachment field went for many, many years without ever doing a twin study, which is really interesting because the, the, you know, from, the, from very early days, people in the field had wondered, and certainly people outside the field had, had claimed that a lot of this attachment business was a load of nonsense, really, because it's probably almost certainly all to do with the child's temperament. You remember people who followed this subject? There was a very famous paper by uh, Lamb and colleagues back in 1984, which was making that basic uh, uh, point. It took a long time before anybody did any actual behavioural genetic research to test the very testable claim that actually, even though most things look quite genetic, apparently variation in attachment security or insecurity is not like that at all, and it's all about the environment. Um, I often say that, that I never really set a question in behavioural genetics exams on how much of the variation in something or other to do with children is genetic because the answer is always somewhere between about 40 and 60%, right? i.e. a lot. So attachment theory is making a very bold claim to say that 100% of the variation in attachment security and insecurity is actually to do with the environment and genetics is irrelevant. Uh, a bold claim that, that has, hadn't been subjected to uh, a, a proper test until relatively recently. So, uh, here's the answer to that question. This is more or less what I, I, I would say, I would summarise the evidence suggests. This is a, the results of a study that we did back in, uh, in uh, 2003, a twin study, looking at the proportion of variation in attachment security or insecurity that you could attribute to genetics uh, and to what's called the shared environment and what's also called the non-shared environment. What you can see there is that the bit that's to do with genetics is entirely absent, so there's nothing there that's representing genetics. The estimate of the genetic influence on attachment security and insecurity was indeed absolutely zero. 
Um, that study has been replicated both by uh, Tom O'Connor and Carla Croft, uh, or replicated, in fact, they came to it first, um, uh, and, and on a larger scale by Glenn Roisman uh, and Chris Fraley in 2008, uh, using a rather different measure of attachment. But the picture is remarkably consistent in that genetic uh, uh, um, contributions to attachment seem to be really very, very small. And that's a very fascinating and interesting and pretty robust uh, um, uh, defence, as it were, of one of the, one of the most basic uh, uh, predictions of attachment theory. And of course, can you imagine? I, I, I remember at the time not really thinking about this when we did this study, but what would we have done if it had turned out to be about 98% genetic? Oh, my God. I would have had to have left town. Um, so it turned out... I mean, it's funny that, um, yes, I didn't contemplate that at all. I just thought, this is fascinating. Let's do it. Uh, but it would have been interesting. But as it turns out, the, the evidence from our study and several others is really quite consistent and very consistent with attachment theory. Or is it? So we then decided, well, hang on a minute... That's very interesting. These are all very young children. It's very consistent with the evidence that attachment security is very much about the environment. It's almost certainly telling us something about the quality of care. But we want to study attachment across the whole lifespan, don't we? And we, and we, and we know that it changes in some way. It's certainly we measure it in a very different way in later stages of the lifespan. And so we went out to do the study again some years later, uh, collaborating with Robert Plowman, uh, uh, who was mentioned earlier. Um, using data from the uh, Twins Early Development Study. We, we conducted, with a, a fairly large sample of 15-year-old twins, the uh, child attachment interview, which is a, a very nice, interesting, in-depth, sort of semi-clinical interview that is designed to reveal something about attachment status in, in teenagers. And the question would be, well, you know, are we going to see exactly the same thing? And in fact, Robert, by the way, in case everyone's slightly biased against you know, assuming that Robert would be excited, would always think everything is genetic, he really wanted to see lots of shared environment. Because he thought that was a really interesting uh, counterexample to so much of what he'd studied in the past. And this is what we found in a nutshell. The shared environment, which we saw so much of when the children were very young, uh, is absolutely zero uh, in adolescence. And we see a very substantial, about 40% of the variation in, a, in, in the security of attachment as measured by the child attachment interview in adolescence is heritable. I find this absolutely fascinating uh, because it's so different to what we saw uh, in, the, in the young children, but it's also very consistent with what we see in many other areas of development which is a very strong uh, signal that there's something heritable in the child that is impacting in some way on the way that they, in this case, think about, reflect on, and talk about in the child attachment interview their, their attachment relationships with primary caregivers. So that's the, that's the first take-home message. Yes, in early development, it looks like attachment theory was basically right. It's very strongly influenced uh, by... Uh, attachment security is very strongly influenced by the environment. Um, and really shows very little evidence of being influenced by genetics. But it looks, and this is only one study, but it's quite a, a large and quite well-designed, though I say so myself, uh, study. Uh, uh, and it, in adolescence, the picture looks very, very different. So the take-home message is we can't assume that what we see in young children will always be the case. And, of course, development is interesting and complex. And it, in a way, I don't think we should be that surprised that genes, in complicated ways... Genes, the child's personality, their traits, their behaviours, their ways of seeing things, their ways of reacting, might start to impact on attachment in later life. OK, actually, I'm going to skip that. So that's the first one, genetics. What about continuity? So I said that attachment theory makes this claim that attachment patterns are laid down in early life, and they stay with us relatively unchanged over time. Uh, and they may even influence uh, the patterns of attachment that a child forms in the next generation. Again, a really interesting claim about how cycles of relational disadvantage might be mediated over time within the same individual, but also cascading down the generation. So what does the evidence say on that? Well, there have been quite a few studies. It takes so long to do this kind of research. We've got one of the studies that have done that, because you have to wait 20 years or something, do a strange situation at the age one, and then follow them for 20 years, think of something to do while you're waiting. <laughs> Um, uh, there are a very small number of studies that have done that, and a lot of them are, very, uh, are also quite small scale. 
couple of them in the early days found that there was quite a lot of continuity. So you measured attachment, the strain situation, then you measured it 20 years later in the adult attachment interview, and a couple of studies found quite a lot of continuity, and then people were excited about that. But they were really small studies. In, relatively recently, in 2014, uh, Ashley Groh and Glenn Roisman and colleagues followed up by far the largest sample uh, that where it was possible to do this uh, into uh, late adolescents at age 18. Um, and this is what they found. So they, they managed to follow up about ne nearly, well, 819 uh, children who were seen in infancy, and then they conducted the adult attachment interview with them uh, in, in adolescence. So in terms of sample size, blowing all of the studies out of the water. And this is what they found. SSP predicting AI 18 years later, a correlation of 0.04. I don't know whether you know what correlations usually look like, but they go from minus one to plus one. 0 0.04 is absolutely tiny, and this wasn't even statistically reliable. Uh, they had some other measures of attachment, so you could say, well, maybe it's something funny about the strain situation. Well, there's a hint that that might be the case because there's a little bit more evidence of continuity when you use a slightly different measure of attachment called the attachment Q set, um, and it's also a little bit later. It's at uh, 24 months, so, you know, two years rather than uh, 15 months. You see a little bit more of a correlation. It's still pretty small, but it's possibly uh, lurching into the not entirely trivial uh, category, but it's certainly small. Um, and if we look at some other ass um, assessments, uh, we also find that the uh, association is very small. So the idea that continuity from infancy to adulthood is very strong, I think we can set that aside. It clearly is not the case. There may be some continuity, but it's weak. But it's certainly all of this evidence suggests that change must surely be the norm. In case you think there's something funny about the, uh, uh, this particular study, and maybe this is just a maybe they just did the measurements wrong, or something methodologically weak about that study. Just for you, by the way, you should feel very special. I did this last night. <laughs> I collected together all of the studies I could find that had ever done this. It's not absolutely 100% uh, systematic review, this. So if I was going to publish it, I'd be a little bit more careful. But it's, it's a pretty good sample of all the studies that have actually measured attachment in early life and then conducted the adult attachment interview uh, in, in uh, adolescence or, late, or into adulthood. Uh, and these are all the effect sizes here. You can see there's a really big one there, 0.5. That was one of the first studies, actually, by Mary Main. All of the others pretty much... There's another strange one there. That's a very small sample. All of the others are rather consistently low. And the average is about 0.09, which is actually very similar to what we saw in the, NIC, the large NICHD study. If you take out the large NICHD study, you could say, well, it's such a big sample, maybe it's biasing everything. Well, if you do that... The, the correlation stays pretty much the same. Uh, if you take out these two rather large effect sizes, because you think maybe they're a bit suspect, um, again, it doesn't change very much. It stays pretty consistently a correlation of about 0 0.08. Very small, but it is significant. So there's a little signal of continuity, but there's an enormous amount of change. What about intergenerational transmission? Because that's a slightly different thing, actually. This is not continuity over large periods of time, necessarily, or long periods of time, I should say. It could be, it's, it's really associations between parental attachment status and the attachment that the child forms to that caregiver. There have been a lot of very interesting studies on that. One of the great studies, actually, was done in London by uh, Miriam Steele, Howard Steele, and, and uh, uh, Peter Fonagy, um, looking at adult attachment status in pregnant women, and then assessing the attachment pattern that the child showed in the strain situation to that, to that parent uh, a little bit more than a year later, and finding very strong associations between those two things, suggesting there's something in the parental state of mind with respect to attachment that influences the evolution of their relationship with their child. Uh, back in uh, 1995, Marinus van Eisendorn, we saw earlier today, did a, a meta-analysis of all studies that had looked at these two things, parental attachment and whether that predicted the child's attachment to that parent. And he found what is a, actually, that's a huge correlation in the social sciences uh, with things that are measured you know, with, without too much uh, bias. That's a, that's a really strong association. Um, and many of you will also know that that study found that parental behaviour was able to account for some of that relationship, uh, but, but not all of it. There was quite a bit missing, um, and that gave birth to this idea of the transmission gap. But I'm not going to talk about that particularly. What I want to focus on is how strong that effect size was. Now, a group of us 
um, had been talking about this. Uh, there's a, there is a bit of a funny story about this because we, we uh, are all members of the Attachment Human Development uh, Journal. And one uh, um, uh, meeting, we had a nice dinner afterwards, and I think we did get slightly drunk. And we started saying, you know that effect size? Have you got any studies that didn't really find this association between adult attachment and child attachment? And we all started confessing that, yes, indeed, we did, and we didn't really know what to make of it. And we started to have doubts, and we worried about whether this was something you could even say, given that this was such an established finding. And then, and then we thought, well, wait a minute, this is a really important question, and actually, you know, we need to look at this. Um, and we, we started to contact all of the colleagues that we knew in the field, and anybody we could think of uh, that had ever done a study like this, um, uh, and, um, and we did a systematic review of the, of the literature and so on, uh, and managed to create an entirely new meta-analysis with a much larger data set than was available to Marinas back in 1995. And in fact, it's extraordinary to see how much that field has changed. So in 1995, Marinas had 19 studies that he could meta-analyse. In other words, pool the results and find out how strong that relationship was. In 2015, uh, we were able to study 95 different papers that had looked at this relationship, 95 independent studies. It's enormous. Obviously, it's quite possible for 95 studies to totally wipe out the earlier findings from just 19. And again, this was an exciting moment because, you know, what's this going to tell us? And again, what would it mean for the field if it turned out that that association had completely disappeared or turned on its head or whatever? You know, but this is the fun of good science, right? It's to get some data. And you know, the more nervous you are about the result, the, the more useful the data is because it's telling you that there's a, there's a very testable hypothesis here. And here's the result. Well, the correlation was, was 0.47 in 1995, and it's dropped down to 0.31. So what does that mean? Well, what it implies is that, first of all, the association is still very clearly there. That's not a trivial association at all. It's very actually consistently replicated in all of those st studies. The other really interesting little sideline here is that many of the, half of the studies we reviewed were, were not published. And even amongst, amongst those sad file draw papers that nobody knew what to do with, that if you put all of those papers together, they still showed an association from one generation to the next, even though individually a lot of them didn't, probably because they were just too small and lacked statistical power. So in some ways you could say, well, that's a really resounding confirmation of one of the basic principles, one of the basic uh, proposition, propositions of attachment theory. But on the other hand, it's also a reason to be a little bit more sober. This is no way near a kind of uh, fully deterministic relationship. It's a much weaker association. It's not small, but it is mod much more modest than we might have expected. There's lots of possibility for that intergenerational transmission process to not lead faithfully sort of from one classification to the uh, other classification that you'd expect. So it's a much more probabilistic process than, than, than that kind of uh, association might have led us to believe. Okay. Oh, and one other little interesting thing is that we found that if you look closely at the data, what you find is that uh, families where there's a lot of social risk, for example, parental uh, postnatal depression, uh, psychiatric diagnosis, or high uh, stress uh, environments, what you find is that the intergenerational transmission process is weaker and not stronger. And our in inference there is that what's happening is that circumstance and stresses, very similar, I think, to what David was saying earlier, is really driving a lot of the struggles, if you like, that are happening in the parent-child relationship. And the, the parents' uh, uh, internal working models of attachment are being sort of overwhelmed by that. OK, um, so last uh, topic is the question of what's the relationship between attachment and children's mental health outcomes. Um, we've done three meta-analytic reviews looking at this question. The first focusing on children's uh, behavioural problems, externalising problems like aggression. The second on anxiety and depression. And then the third on children's social competence. And I'll summarise those uh, reviews for you now. So here's the first one on externalising problems. And uh, what I'm going to show you is just a quick sort of summary of how strong the relationship was between a measure of attachment in relatively early life and some later measure uh, of uh, behavioural problems. And there's your answer. Um, this bar here is if you just pull all of the children who were classified as insecure in the strain situation, and the, bar, the length of the bar tells you sort of how much more likely insecure children were to show some level of behavioural problems compared to the children who were secure. And that effect size is just over what's, a, 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 what's called a Cohen's D of 
That's very statistically reliable. So the first answer to this question is yes. Insecure children clearly do show more behavioural problems than, than secure ones. For those of the, you who are a little bit statistically minded, you might notice that a D of 0.3 is a small effect size. Um, you can't translate that directly. Or you can, it's, it's not the same as a correlation, it's, but this would be something like a correlation of about 0 0.16, 0 0.17. So it's, a, it's actually quite a weak effect. So it's there and it's quite reliable, but we could nowhere near say that there's a strong connection between attachment insecurity and children's behavioural problems. It's weak, it's probabilistic, it's not deterministic. The other interesting thing is that the different patterns of insecure attachment show different levels of, kind of, uh, uh, of effect. Um, a, a, quite a weak association for avoidant children and resistant ones, and almost all the action is coming from the children who got a disorganised classification. Another thing to notice is that we found a few factors that seem to make a difference. We found stronger associa associations in older children. We found stronger associations in any other measure of attachment apart from the strain situation. Detachment Q-set, stronger, the Cassidy and Marvin uh, attachment assessment, which all of these actually tend to also be done a little bit later, st showing stronger effects. We found that there were stronger associations in clinical groups, and we found stronger associations in males. Again, I think that's all interesting food for thought. It suggests to me that we might need to think quite developmentally about when and why does attachment affect behavioural problems. It may be that actually as children get older, their attachment relationships change and, and they become more important in predicting later developmental uh, difficulties with, with aggression, for example. It also suggests to me that there are measurement issues here. How you measure it makes quite a difference um, and that probably needs carefully looking at. And the level of, of risk in the family comes up again, although actually interestingly in the other direction uh, to what we saw in the intergenerational transmission question. So a weak effect, not a strong one. If anyone tells you that attachment, security and insecurity completely predicts you know, how a child's going to be doing and whether they have aggression later on, uh, it's just not true. At least so far, as far as we can tell, a sober reading of the data is there's a relationship. But there's lots of other things that impact on how children develop. We shouldn't be surprised by that, right? Human nature is a complicated thing. Child development is multi-determined, we know that. And actually, attachment theory just, or at least the evidence suggests that that's true in attachment, just like many other outcomes. What about internalising problems? Maybe all the actions there, or maybe we'll see whopping great effect sizes when we look at internalising problems. Well, these are the effect sizes for internalising problems from a similar review. And you can see the effect sizes are smaller, not bigger. I'll put them side by side just for fun. That's externalising again. That's the one you've seen. That's internalising. You can see it's substantially stronger association between attachment and aggressive behavioural problems, let's say, relative to attachment and uh, internalising problems like anxiety and depression. So again, a bit of a surprise there. And then what about social competence? Well, this is what we find for social competence. I'm going to do this in reverse order, like some cheesy game show. <laughs> so, coming in last is the Internalising Problems Association, never even really pushing above a point two. Uh, next, you see the Externalising Problems superimposed on that. And again, it just shows you how much more robust the association is for externalising problems. And then finally, when you add in it, uh, social competence, that's what you see. So social competence actually ends up being the most consistent and robust association. It's actually not dramatically different to the externalising one. That's not a huge difference, neither is that. That's quite a big difference, interestingly enough. Um, again, that's fairly uh, similar to what we saw in the case of externalising problems. So this is very interesting, I think, because it suggests to me that there's something profoundly social about the mechanisms linking uh, attachment to later outcomes. Because... Um, because partly we see the most consistent effects for social competence. And of course we know that a lot of difficulties associated with, with externalising problems are really about um, social norms and about social relationships, uh, aggression, peer relationships and so on. So my suspicion is that that's really why we're seeing these more consistent associations between attachment and externalising problems and social competence in particular. And internalising problems, it's a slight, clearly slightly different story. I should add here, just as a caveat, that these are children up to about the age of 12 or 14, so basically pre-adolescence, so the story could be different after that. So there you go. Um, 
Final thing I wanted to highlight, I would really, for, for, for those of you who are interested in the role of attachment in social policy and social care uh, policy in particular, I'd really encourage you to read this paper because this paper is a, a, a position statement by very many people who've been working in the field for, for many years. In response to concerns around the way in which the concept of disorganised attachment is used in child protection uh, context in particular. Um, and we refer to various forms of evidence that suggest that it would be ex an extremely uh, unwise idea to use the uh, concept of disorganised attachment, certainly in isolation, in any kind of child uh, protection uh, proceedings and as forms of evidence. The assessment itself is extremely difficult and many people in, in the social care world use the concept without even having been trained in how to assess it. And many people who have been trained struggle to do it very uh, consistently. The measurement is actually quite susceptible to exactly how you run the procedure, even if you are going to run the procedure. Um, and we already know from what I showed you before that disorganised attachment is not strongly implicated in very poor outcomes for children. Um, it's, a, it's a weak and, and unreliable association. Um, and we also know that there are lots of other causes of disorganised attachment, including social deprivation, parental psychopathology and trauma and so on. So if, we, if, if people are tempted to make a, a direct read across from disorganised attachment to maltreatment, which is happening in some contexts, this paper pleads you not to on the basis of the empirical evidence. Okay, so um, is the, is the, there's the full story about where I think we are at, more or less, in terms of the evidence supporting and clarifying the importance of attachment uh, in children's development. Is it half empty or half full? I think I'll leave it to you to decide. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk, most stimulating. You were actually slightly ahead of time, so we've got plenty of time for questions, um, and then tea break, and then our final speaker, Jonathan Green. Okay. In that case, can I show... I did put on... I said I would, I would um, do some cheeky, genuine myths. Can I just quickly list yeah. those, if we have time? Because I, yeah. I was going to skip it, but... Um, I think I've said this. I called it... Whoops, sorry. I think these things you can all agree with. Myth bingo. Anyone want to play? <laughs> Insecurity of attachment in a fixed early period of development determines later outcomes. Yes? No? No. No, I don't think so. <laughs> this is a really weird kind of game show. Isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, attachment must be with the mother. No. Thank you. Um, children only have one attachment or one main attachment. No. No? Very good. You're such a good, well-informed audience. <laughs> Attachment doesn't change. No. Absolutely not. Clearly it changes. Attachment as a social construct doesn't exist in some societies. I, I don't know. I, I, I put a little hmm. <laughs> I, I, there is a very interesting challenge from the anthropologists around attachment. I don't think there's enough really good research to be able to robustly say we know that that's not true. My instincts are, and everything I've seen, and I have studied attachment in some very different non-UK contexts, and I am yet to see any society where I don't think I can see attachment. But I would love to be proved wrong, because that would be so interesting, wouldn't it? But I, so I think the answer is almost certainly it's very likely that it's a universal construct uh, and, and is present in all societies. But wouldn't it be great to do some really interesting and properly rigorous research that's not just anthropologists pondering and going around with a notebook and having ideas, but actually properly observing uh, uh, parent-child relationships in very kind of non-Western contexts where the structure of care is extremely different. I think that would be very, very interesting. I'd like someone to do that, or maybe, um, maybe I'll try and do it sometime. All problems experienced by maltreated children or who are in care are due to attachment insecurity. No. no? Yeah, you sure? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, uh, Stephen spoke up particularly loudly there. That's right, attachment is obviously relevant to these children, but we can't think that that's everything. Um, oh, I gave away. Oh, oh, damn. <laughs> no. Attachment can only be to an adult. No. You, well, you know what I think, but what do you no. think? No. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting one. Some people take a very strong view on this. 
that, you know, Bowlby's original thinking was that the whole point is that you're attaching to someone who is stronger, wiser, more, more a reliable, you know, provider of protection to you. Personally, I mean, I've seen communities where quite young children are often actually primary caregivers or very um, consistent caregivers, and I'm pretty sure I see attachments. But again, I think it's really... Yeah, right, exactly. And, and who can be a significant other, I think, is a really interesting thing. And to me, it raises the whole question uh, of, of what little we know about how that process happens. How does a child figure out, mm, do you know what, I'm not going to attach to you, you're a bit hopeless or whatever, I'm going to go over to this person. Or, you know, we, we know nothing about the way in which attachments form. For people who are interested in the children who went through Romanian orphanages, for example, the question of how do attachment form, how does attachment form, uh, and, and what impact might there be when there are severe um, challenges to that process as it's happening in formation, I think is extremely clinically important, but we know nothing about it. We just wait until they're 12 and we chuck them in the strain situation. It's all happened by that stage. So that's an interesting one. Um, and I think the jury's out, but I suspect that... I there was a beautiful presentation... Um, by Judy Mesman at SRCD a few years ago, where she showed some videotapes of a, of, uh, a little toddler playing with a... Uh, well, a little infant playing with a four-year-old sibling, I think, in the, in the South American jungle somewhere. And they're playing and having a nice time, uh, and then something frightens the, the little baby, and the baby just goes straight to this four-year-old, and the four-year-old gets top marks on names with sensitivity scale, beautifully sensitive, picks, and this is just this gorgeous little scene of the four-year-old patting the little one-year-old on the back, lifting him off the ground, which is quite impressive in itself. And so, you know, it really made me question, uh, you know, what is the range and scope of, of the sorts of attachments that children might be able to form? Okay, so that's that one. D oh, sorry. <laughs> disinhibited social engagement disorder, that's me being disinhibited, um, is unrelated to attachment. This is controversial. Um, and my view, anyway, is that we don't know yet. My strong suspicion is that Charlie Zena is right, that disinhibited social engagement disorder is not, as such, a disorder of attachment, because these, some of these children show very normal-looking attachment behaviour, but it may be the consequences of a severe disturbance to attachment processes happening early in life, and so there's probably a halfway house there. Um, the strain situation measures everything we need to know about attachment perfectly. No. Thank you. Uh, disorganised attachment means the child is highly likely to have been abused and neglected. No. No. Great. I think you got them all right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Question. <laughs> we have ten minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would you be able to comment on attachment and cognitive development, not in terms of abil ability, but in terms of thinking pattern? Um, hmm. That's interesting. I, um, oh, it's really difficult to say. I mean, I, I think it depends what you mean by thinking pattern. We do have some evidence that there is an association between attachment security and um, <laughs> cognitive development measured somewhat traditionally, um, and that's a weak association. Uh, it seems to be slightly stronger for language development than it is for sort of pure uh, um, uh, fluid intelligence skills, for example. But if you think much more broadly about sort of the idea of, of thinking patterns, then obviously it's, it's much more difficult to answer but, and, and also more interesting. So, I mean, we... Uh, I reviewed some literature looking at the relationship between attachment and how children think in a sort of socio-emotional realm. So there are quite a lot of nice studies looking at how children will make sense of a, a, a social... a challenging social situation. Um, so, you know, somebody is playing with your toy and then breaks it. What do, what do you think that means? How would you respond? Um, and, and so on, and, and getting children to think about that. Um, and there you do see quite consistent uh, relationships with, in, with secure children showing a sort of a more sophisticated and mature way of understanding, navigating and responding to you know, social uh, experience. So I think if I, if I had to put my money on it, I'd say that if, if, if that's what you mean to a certain extent, at least partially overlaps with, with what you're talking about, then I would say, yes, I think there probably 
is some reasonable evidence that there's a relationship there. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes. No, well, I think, yes. I mean, that's... So, I think the question is, um, is the adult attachment interview measuring attachment? Is that what you mean? As opposed to thinking patterns or other processes? It, it, I, well, if that's what your question is, I'll, I'll pretend that it is, because it's a subject I like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a really important and interesting question. So, because with our twin study, one interpretation is that attachment was measured, you know, we measure it here, we then measure it here at 15, it's the same construct and, and, it's, and the factors causing it have changed from one time to the next. Another interpretation is that we've measured attachment, I'm pretty confident the strain situation measures attachment, um, but then in adolescence we measure something else which is a, actually a psychologically more complex phenomenon that is, is, is informative about attachment and may influence it, but may not be a measure of attachment. I'm actually fairly convinced that that's probably true. And it certainly is not hard to understand why that kind of measurement, which is tapping into emotional regulation, how one sort of manages social interaction in an interview, uh, how one processes early experiences, reflects on, mentalizes, and so on. That's a really rich combination of psychological skills. It, 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 to me, it seems that it's not surprising that that shows some role for genetics. Um, but also that it's, it's sort of obvious in a way that it's not tapping into precisely the same construct uh, of attachment that we think of when we talk about children. I'd love to know whether attachment, as in genuine you know, proximity-seeking when frightened and distressed, is still present in adolescence and could be measured if we just had the right machinery to do it. At the moment, I don't think we really do. And that, that would, you know, then you could actually tease apart properly whether this is uh, a different construct um, or it's a different time that we're picking up. Um, I'm interested in when, sorry, we're just doing the microphone. We'll get to you, we'll get to you in a minute. Oh, OK. <laughs> It was just a yeah. quick related point, sort of that 18 seems a bit young to be doing an adult attachment interview, you know, knowing what we know about yeah, that's, adolescent that's right. brain yeah, development. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And there's, there actually is a few, um, there have been a couple of studies that show that if you measure it at that age, things do change a bit. Um, and, it, and, it's, and, it, and in fact, funnily enough, the, the patterns of, of response that you see feed directly into all your stereotypes about teenagers. So you see a lot of dismissing uh, uh, responses, particularly amongst males. We found that in our uh, uh, child attachment interview study. So, so you're right, it's picking up you know, something that's probably a, a work in progress in terms of how attachment, or whatever we want to think of it as, um, is, is developing. Having said that, when I listed all those papers, you know, the ones that I managed to find last night, some of those are, are, are well into, mid, into the mid-20s and some late-20s. So it's, you know, I'd be surprised if we found that by the time you get to a certain age, suddenly that continuity reappears. I mean, that would be, that would be amazing, but it, it's sort of unlikely, I think. Right. Sorry. Um, I'm delivering some training next week. I'm a specialist teacher for social, emotional and mental health um, uh, to teachers and teaching assistants in our district. And I'm just wondering what you would like me to emphasise what would be your key messages that perhaps they haven't heard before because the only thing they've ever known about attachment is the strange situation and maybe a couple of bits about the key kind of types of attachment. So now we know a little bit more, Ooh. what would great, what, great what would your well, your key messages to put out to the to the education professionals who are working directly with these children in classrooms and they'll be primary school age <laughs> what do uh, we tell absolutely them? brilliant question <laughs> um oh that's so hard I, I think i suppose i would say um um <laughs> i would say no, no, I don't well know. i would well I, I would i think i think for teachers it's helpful to know that children do for, there's, there's a whole stream of research about whether or not children form attachments to their teachers I think it's quite hard to be definitive about these things, but I can say for sure that children need to feel that there are adults who care for them and are responsive to their needs. And so the concept of, of nurturing responsive caregiving and of feeling safe and understood 
which are all kind of elements that we think are really important in attachment, are really important for children wherever they go. Um, and it's especially important, I think, in school. Some children will need more of that from their teacher than other children for all sorts of reasons to do with them and their families and so on. Um, but that, that basic principle, I think, stands the test of time. What doesn't stand so well is that there's, you know, um, that their only source of kind of attachment-related security is with a single figure, and that's their mum. It's nowhere near as straightforward as that. Um, and I think it's really important that they understand that, that not everything they see is about their attachments. They, there may be stuff going on with their peers. It, you might need to look at your, the way you manage the classroom, as Tamsin was picking up earlier. Mm -hmm. So important. Um, you, you, if this child is, is, a, is, a, is a child looked after, yes, it might be about attachment, but it might not be. It might be that they're experiencing trauma or they have other psychiatric difficulties. So the lesson is it's important, but it's not the whole story, so you have to actually put it all together in a sort of comprehensive view of what might be happening for this child and remember that this child will probably value your relationship but with the relationship they have with you and you're, you're a very helpful source of feelings of comfort and security. Okay, next question. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. John Richard, Oxford. M many years ago, somebody called Margaret Manning, wonderful researcher and sadly now dead, did some work on hostility in children and she noted three types of hostility and saw that some children were specialists in some sorts of hostility, although all children were capable of doing all three types. When Pat Crittenden talks about attachment, she talks about strategies that children use, the avoidance strategy or the ambivalent strategy and so on. And, and I suppose one could say that people who get classified as avoidant are avoidant specialists, even though they're capable of other... Mm. Is there any mileage in looking at attachment in terms of strategies that, where we're capable of all these strategies, but we tend to specialise? Thank you for that question. I absolutely agree. I think that's a really great, great point. I, I think I had it buried in the slide, but I mean, I think there are profound measurement problems at the moment that, that with, with the way that we do attachment. In fact, I, I would go as far as to say that the attachment paradigm, in terms of the measurement tools we've got, has all, will run out of steam quite soon because there are fundamental issues that have never been properly sorted out. And, and one of those is about the continuity, or the, sorry, the continuum of attachment-related behaviour. We've stuck with this kind of classifications um, when we know, I mean, you know, for example, uh, one really important take-home message, by the way, um, uh, for practitioners, is that you know, if you read the, te the textbook, it says that children who are avoidant don't turn to their attachment figures when they're worried or upset or distressed. That's just not true. It's true in the very kind of refined circumstances of the strain situation, but if you do home observations, Mary Ainsworth did lots of very rich and extensive home observations where she found that children who were classified as, as, as avoidant in the strange situation certainly did approach their carers in the home. In fact, they were often the most fussy and difficult ones. So actually, it's a much more dynamic process that we're, we're trying to capture here um, and that it changes. And it's probably, as you were saying, it's about thresholds. So under certain circumstances in the strain situation, what we're getting at is something about the threshold that a child has. And for an avoidant child, their threshold to seek care when they're um, a bit worried or anxious you know, is a little bit higher, I think, for whatever reason, than uh, a secure child. And, and that's probably a better way of understanding it. But we don't have tools that allow us to think about all of that nuance and flexibility uh, and, and, uh, uh, and probably the continua that exist between these kind of, at the moment, rather discrete categories that probably don't, don't capture nature at its joints. The other thing is that I think related to, I think, the other point you made, which is that the way in which children engage in social interaction, so going forwards a bit in terms of the example you gave to think about how they interact with their peers, I think is a really, really interesting question. And, we, and again, we know very little about that. There are clues, for example, that the children who are resistant, they show incompetent social behaviour but are not aggressive and actually would more likely to get bullied or, or, you know, and, and be anxious in social interactions. And that the disorganised children might be a little bit more likely to become proactively aggressive, for example. But you know, there's a whole interesting set of questions there that hasn't been thoroughly studied. Right. Um, before we thank you again, I just want to remind you what's happening now. Uh, we have 20 minutes of tea break, exactly. And then we'll be back here in 20 minutes for Jonathan Green's talk.
Um, then we have a panel discussion for 20 minutes where we'd like all the speakers uh, to come back here and then you can be thinking of further questions you'd like to ask the speakers uh, for that last 20 minutes before we close. So, and thank you again to, to Pasco for a great talk. <laughs>